Lowry addressing the controversy today. Given the wide-ranging nature of change that is likely to be taken in hand, some naturally find it inconvenient to accept, to accept its inevitability. The recent incident of stealing the emails of scientists at the University of East Anglia shows that some would go to the extent of carrying out illegal acts, perhaps in an attempt to discredit the IPCC. But the panel has a record of transparent and objective assessment stretching over 21 years, performed by tens of thousands of dedicated scientists from all corners of the globe. I'm proud to inform this conference that the findings of the AR4 are based on measurements made by many independent institutions worldwide that demonstrate significant changes in, on land, in the atmosphere, the oceans, and in the ice-covered areas of the Earth. The internal consistency from multiple lines of evidence strongly supports the work of the scientific community, including those individuals singled out in these email exchanges. Uh, that was Rajendra Prachauri, who is addressing uh, this issue, this controversy, that Ivo de Boer, uh, the head of the Climate Change Conference, has called extremely damaging. Um, Liddy Nakpal, anything you want to add on this issue? It's certainly become, a, um, to say the least, an issue at this time when this critical meeting is taking place. Yeah, well, perhaps it's not very surprising that some quarters will try to undermine the credibility of uh, scientists as well as the leaders of governments that are now meeting today. But I think uh, we should not give much credence to these kinds of attempts to undermine the issue. I think we have reached a point after many years of debates that most if not all of the world leaders, are convinced that the issue is indeed very urgent and that nothing must distract the leaders as well as the movements around the world from addressing the issues Talk now. Talk about extreme weather in the Philippines just in the last few months. Well, um, I think everyone has seen in YouTube, as also in mainstream news uh, uh, broadcasts, in September, we suffered in the Philippines, in Metro Manila, one of the—an uh, unprecedented disaster, and that was caused by a typhoon named Ondoy, where when we actually experienced rainfall, we normally experience in 30 days, happened in six hours. Mm -hmm. So it actually transformed Metro Manila, which is the capital of the, the country, to like raging rivers and lakes all around. So millions of families had to be driven away from their homes. Uh, thousands of uh, hundreds of uh, millions of dollars were actually worth of destruction happened in terms of cars, buildings, infrastructure. And I wish I wish we could show the video right, right now, but because it really shocked everyone about how this could happen. And of course, there's a lot of factors, but you cannot. Uh, deny that climate change has something to do with it. There's government neglect, of course, the infrastructures were not well maintained, but how can you otherwise explain something like this? And then it didn't stop there. Another typhoon came the following week. It caused massive destruction in the north, landslides, also hundreds of people were killed. And this hasn't happened to us ever. And this is now part of what we are seeing as very frequent disasters and worsening of typhoons in the last several years. So we can't say that climate change is not a factor to this. What is climate debt, the issue of reparations, in a sense? Well, it, uh, it has been an issue we've been raising in the last few years, that we should see the problem of climate change as a debt that is owed by the rich countries to the rest of the world, to the developing nations especially, but also to the uh, south in the north, uh, in the northern countries. This, is, this rests on, our, on what is clearly the responsibility of rich countries, of corporations, for creating the problem, for taking up the atmosphere atmospheric space more than what they are entitled to, so that the rest of the world, the developing world especially, is deprived of that space and now have to deal with the impacts of the problem that they created. Um, Democracy Now! producer Mike Burke um, briefly had a chance on Sunday to question Ivo de Boer, the executive secretary of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. He had just finished an interview with NBC and was racing to his next appointment when uh, Mike and Elizabeth Press caught up with him.
Sir, can I ask you one question? We're working on a segment regarding uh, the issue of climate reparations, and I want to know, is this something you support with the United States? Reparations? What do you mean? Uh, this, there's a, you know, the concept of a climate debt that the United States and other uh, wealthy nations owe a debt to uh, African nations and other developing nations. Well, I think the fact that we're talking here about very significant money um, to help African countries adapt to the impacts of climate change and change the pattern of their economic growth is exactly intended to address those concerns that developing countries have. And how, how much money is needed? Um, over the short term, I think we need $10 billion a year for 2010, 2011, 2012. That and was the Evo De Boer, the head of the Climate Change Conference. Now, interestingly, as we're going to air, it was announced that the U.S. Uh, XM Bank, the uh, Export-Import Bank, has just given $3 billion to um, an Exxon-led consortium constructing a n liquid natu uh, natural gas plant in Papua New Guinea. Uh, Salum il uh talk about the money that is going into subsidizing corporations' large projects versus this idea of debt and reparations. Well, I think one of the biggest issues that we have to confront here, and hopefully Copenhagen will put us on that path, is how to wean ourselves globally off a very dangerous fossil fuel-dependent global economy, coal, oil and natural gas, which we've invested trillions of dollars in and which corporations have invested trillions of dollars in and want to continue to protect their investments. We do need, as a globe, to move away from this into a cleaner, greener technology and energy pathway, and at the same time protect the most vulnerable citizens on this planet from the inevitable and unavoidable impacts of climate change. So we're talking about <clears throat> two sets of investments. Firstly, investments being moved from fossil fuel into new, cleaner energy, which in climate change jargon we call mitigation. And secondly, we are also talking about giving money to the poorest people on the planet to deal with the impacts that are not their making, but is the making of the, the rich, and hence the, the notion of debt. And that's in the climate change jargon called adaptation. So we're going to need money for mitigation and money for adaptation in the hundreds of billions of dollars. And yet, for example, the United States has at this moment not pledged anything. Well, they're beginning to pledge. They are talking about it. In fact, Congress <coughs> has recently uh, allocated funding for international climate finance, part of it for adaptation funding. So. The, which wasn't the case under the Bush regime. So the Obama regime has actually reversed its antipathy to paying anything, but they haven't paid a lot yet, and they have, are going to have to up the ante as long as, along with other developed countries who are going to have to pay. When, when you think of the hundreds of billions of dollars that are going to be needed for this, one might think at one level that they're very large, but if you then compare them with the trillions of dollars that were produced out of thin air to pay banks, in the recent recession, then saving the planet doesn't seem that expensive anymore. It surely is worth more than saving a few banks. Tom Goldtooth, can you talk about um, what seems to be a confusion of numbers that's coming out of the United States, different than for the rest of the world, when it comes to a commitment for reducing um, the whole issue of, uh, of carbon emissions, of um, uh, global gas? Um, emissions. What are these numbers? The, some talk about 2005, some talk about 1990. Yes, yes. And I think that uh, the public and civil society really need to, to, to zero in on the numbers that are being tossed around, uh, the acceptable uh, uh, number as far as a, a baseline, a level that we're utilizing uh, within these uh, international negotiations is uh, looking at 1990 levels, okay? So that's why, like, within uh, our position, what we call the Red Road Platform in Copenhagen is standing behind the developing countries' position as far as what the emission reduction targets that they're demanding from Annex One countries, which is the, the developing countries.
countries, uh, recognizing the alliance of small island states who are asking for 45 percent reduction level by 2020 at 1990 levels. And uh, we're elevating within our network, standing uh, with the Indigenous Peoples Caucus here, standing behind our Indigenous brother, the President of Bolivia, who is demanding 49 percent reduction. Uh, by 2020 at 1990 levels. Now you compare that with what uh, one of the uh, climate legislation that's on the table back home in the United States, the Kerry Boxer legislation. It's using 20 percent reduction uh, by 2020, but at 2005 levels. So it, it, it looks good What's to the American about? people. And when you use when you compute that to 1990 levels, it comes out to about 4 percent. 4 percent reduction level. So for those of us that have been engaged, coming from the belly of the beast now, it's very embarrassing to have leadership coming from our country who we stood behind. We stood behind